Hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining me. My name is Dr. Nova Schiller and I am the veterinary medical advisor of BioGal Labs. I also worked for many years as a veterinarian in small animal practices and today will be the first of a series of webinars talking about the world of canine vaccines. In the last few years, especially with the coronavirus epidemic, more and more people have been asking questions about vaccines, wanting to know more. And so I wanted to do these webinars to explain to uh, pet parents, to dog owners, about their dog vaccines, about why we do them, what they are, when should we do them, when should we not give them. And so today I want to start from the basics. How do vaccines even work? What are they? So basically what we're doing is we're injecting into the body of the dog a weak or killed microorganism. This microorganism can be a virus, can be bacteria, or something else. Most vaccines are viral vaccines that are mainly viruses. And why are we doing this? Why are we injecting this dead or weak virus into the dog body? Because we want the dog to develop an immune response for the virus without actually getting sick. So this is what happens. The body will develop what is called the primary immune response against the virus. This is the first time the body comes in contact with this specific virus. And I will explain later what the immune response involves, but one of the things it, it involves is the production of what are called antibodies, or which are specific to the antigen of the virus, which again, I will get into more detail later. So the body basically eliminates the virus, but these antibodies stay, and in that way, it remembers the virus. And if a dog is infected again, but this time with a live virus that can make him sick, the body can re react much faster to eliminate the virus before the dog gets sick or with a mild disease. And this is called our secondary immune response. What is the immunological response in general? We have two main types of cells in our immunological response. We have our T cells and we have our B cells. The T cells are divided into a few types of cells. We have the cytotoxic T cells, which are also called kill T cells, because that's what they do. They kill an infected cells of the body. We have our helper T cells, which help uh, activate and assist the B cells. And we have our memory T cells. These are cells that will remain in the body long term, even for years, and they are a part of our secondary immune response. We then have our B cells, and when they're activated, they turn into plasma cells. These plasma cells produce antibodies that attach to the antigen, and we have our memory B cells, which stay in the body for years. These two last, these antibodies and these memory B cells are also the ones that will stay in the body long term, and they are also part of our secondary immune response. Let's get into a little more detail about what are antigens and what are antibodies. So every living thing will have what are called antigens, and it's specific to the living thing. It is basically kind of like their lock. Uh, so every virus, every bacteria will have its own specific lock. And what is the key to this lock? It's the antibodies. The antibodies are produced by the body and are specific to each antigen. So every lock has its own specific key. There are different types of antibodies. Two important ones are called immunoglobulin M and immunoglobulin G. The immunoglobulin M or IgM are the ones that are the first to arrive on the scene. They're the quickest to be produced. However, they attack the virus, they help eliminate the virus, and then they go away. So they're part of our primary immune response, but not part of our secondary immune response. The IgGs, on the other hand, are a bit slower to produce. They come a bit later. However, they remain in the body for longer. They can remain for months or even for years, and they are an important component of the secondary immune response of how the body will react to the virus the second time he meets him, and a very important part of how vaccines work and why we vaccinate. So what vaccinations do we have in dogs? The vaccinations in dogs are divided into two main groups. We have our core vaccines and our non-core vaccines. The core vaccines are the vaccines that are recommended for all dogs. It doesn't matter where they live. It doesn't matter their lifestyle. Why are these recommended for all dogs? Because they protect against diseases 
that pass very easily from dog to dog and are often serious and fatal diseases. These, we have four viruses in this core vaccine group. We have our canine parvovirus, our canine distemper virus, our canine adenovirus, and our rabies virus. The non-core vaccines are a group of vaccines that might be indicated for certain dogs. It depends where they live, it depends on their lifestyle, and in general, we kind of evaluate what the risk is of the dogs get infected by these diseases. In this group, we have Leptospira, which is a non-core vaccine. However, it's almost a core vaccine because it is strongly recommended. Why? Because it is endemic in many areas in the world, and it's also what's called a zoonotic disease. A zoonotic disease is a disease that can pass from dog to human. Other non-core vaccines that we have are Lyme, Bordetella, Influenza, and there are other non-core vaccines. So I do want to talk to you guys a little bit now about these core vaccine diseases. I think it is important as pet owners that you understand what these diseases are, a bit about how they work, to, to better understand also why we vaccinate for them. So we have our canine parvovirus, which some of you might have heard of. A, some of you might have even had dogs that have been sick with canine parvovirus. It is a highly contagious disease. It is very easily transmitted from dog to dog. The transmission is not only from contact of a sick dog with a healthy dog, but also if a healthy dog comes in contact with infected feces or also just infected surfaces. It is a virus that infects the intestines and the immune system, and it will cause really bad diarrhea and vomiting. So we'll see really usually really sick puppies with bad diarrhea and bad vomiting and just very weak puppies. It can lead to death especially in puppies that have a less developed immune system than adults. And one of the biggest problems with this virus is there is no treatment. We cannot, we don't have any medicine that will directly kill the virus. The only thing that the veterinarians can do is give supportive care to these animals. What does that mean? To try to help stop the diarrhea and stop the vomiting and encouraging and the, the, these puppies to eat and get stronger so they can by themselves eliminate the virus. We then have our canine distemper virus. Our canine distemper virus is also a contagious disease. The infection is through uh, an infected dog coughing or sneezing or its saliva or its urine or again infected surfaces. This virus infects the lungs, the intestines, and the nervous system. And we will see typically dogs with fever, with kind of respiratory symptoms of nasal discharge, of coughing, intestinal problems that will cause diarrhea, and sometimes we can also have seizures in these dogs. This virus can also cause death, again, especially in puppies, and again, there is no treatment for this virus, only supportive care. We then have our canine adenovirus. Our canine adenovirus causes infectious canine hepatitis. It is also a contagious disease and it will pass with contact with infected feces or urine or saliva or again surfaces. I do want to stop for a second and talk about this point in all three of these viruses because I think it is important to understand that these viruses don't just pass from contact of a sick animal with a healthy animal, but also by just this healthy animal sniffing the feces of an infected animal, the urine, the grass, the pavement. So we have to understand that and be especially careful with puppies that haven't been vaccinated yet. This is a point that I will talk much more in detail about in the webinar I'll be doing about puppies. So let's get back to canine adenovirus. This virus infects the liver and it causes severe liver disease. And we will see generally a dog with fever, weak dog that doesn't want to eat, then when we're touching its belly, it kind of scrunches up in pain. You can have jaundice, which is a yellowing of the skin and of the gums and of the eyes. And typically, they will also have vomiting and diarrhea. This virus can also lead to death, again, especially in puppies. And again, we do not have treatment and we only have supportive care. The rabies virus, which is probably the most known out of all the viruses, 
it's a contagious disease. It is transmitted in a different way than the other three viruses because the virus will be present in the saliva of a sick dog and it will be transmitted through bite or scratch. It infects the nervous system, especially the brain, and we'll see dogs with fever that are very agitated, that become aggressive and start biting, that develop a fear of water, that become hyperactive. We can have paralysis of the leg muscles, so the legs stop working, or the throat muscles, so this dog can't swallow, and that's what typically gives this salivation and a lot of saliva comes out of the dog's mouth. It can cause seizures, coma, and in most cases, death. In reality, it will always lead to death because these dogs will be euthanized. There is no treatment for this virus, and as opposed to the other viruses, it is a virus that can infect also humans, and it will cause a grave disease also in humans. And lastly, we have the Leptospira, which, like I said, it's not a core vaccine, but it almost is. It is not a virus, it's a bacteria, and the dog will get infected in contact with infected urine or water. So if the, if the dog will drink from a puddle that's infected, or soil. It is what's called a multi-organ disease, which means that it infects all sorts of organs of the body, all sorts of parts of the body, mostly the kidney and the liver. And the symptoms can change a lot because it depends what organs it infects. It does, it can be treated. It is a bacteria that has antibiotics that can treat it. However, one of the main problems of Leptospira is, especially in puppies, it can progress, it can get bad very, very quickly. In a matter of days, it can lead to death. So sometimes we don't even have the chance to try to fight it and to try to treat it. And that is why it is almost a core vaccine. It is also a zoonotic disease, which means that it can also infect humans. Now I want to talk to you guys about the vaccination protocol. So what is a vaccination protocol. So a, a lot of animal organizations, in this case I took the Small Animal Veterinary Association, which is Wasava, uh, do have these protocols. They are scientifically based protocols that will give us guidelines on when we should vaccinate our dogs. It is a generalized protocol, which means that it is the same for every dog. The main difference is that we have a protocol for puppies and a protocol for adults, but it is not individualized. It is not a protocol for an individual dog, but for all dogs in general. So let's start with the vaccination protocol for puppies. Puppies have what are called maternally derived antibodies. I, I will get more into it in the webinar I do about puppies, but in general, these antibodies are antibodies that the puppy gets from the milk of the mother in the first few weeks of his life. And these antibodies can stay in the body for more or less time. As long as they're present in the body of the puppy, the vaccination won't work. And that is why we do a series of vaccinations and not just one. So for our three core viruses, for parvovirus, adenovirus, and distemper virus, the recommendation is to do the first dose at six to eight weeks of age, then every two to four weeks until 16 weeks of age. For rabies, the first dose is done at 12 weeks of age, and in high-risk areas, a second dose will be given two to four weeks after. And for Leptospira, the first dose is at eight weeks of age, and the second dose is two to four weeks later. The vaccination protocol for adults, so for our three core viruses, we do a booster at six or 12 months of age, and then every three years is the current recommendation. Rabies will do a booster at year one and then every one or every three years. It depends on the type of vaccine. The vaccines can change from country to country. There are also some countries that have laws for how often you need to vaccinate for rabies. So it's either one or three years. And for Leptospira, we have a yearly vaccination. Senior dogs or older dogs, which I will be doing a webinar about these senior dogs, eh, tend to respond less to vaccines. So we might not be vaccinating them enough. So are we vaccinating too much or are we not vaccinating enough? The answer to both of these questions is yes. Why is the answer yes? So there's four main reasons. 
We have the individual dog. What does that mean? Each dog is different, and each immune response of the dog is different. So some dogs can have these antibodies that are really important for our secondary immune response. They're really important for fighting these diseases. They can have them for more than three years, even a lot more than three years. And some dogs might have them for less than three years. And we have our puppies that we talked about that have these maternal antibodies. These maternal antibodies can stay in their body for more or for less time. It also depends on the individual puppy. So for some puppies, they're only present for a few weeks, and for some puppies, they can be there for more than 16 weeks. And this, like we said, interferes with vaccinations. Then we have our senior dogs uh, that are less responsive to vaccinations. So maybe we need to vaccinate them more often than every three years. On the, uh, on the other hand, these senior dogs tend to have chronic diseases and chronic treatments, and we might not want to vaccinate a dog that doesn't need to be vaccinated. And our fourth group, it is a small group, but we have non-responsive dogs. We've seen this more frequently with Dobermans and Rottweilers. These are dogs that vaccines don't work on them, that they don't develop these antibodies when they're given a vaccine. So even if we give them one vaccination, and even if we give them 10 vaccinations, they don't respond to them. And it is important to know who these dogs are and be a lot more careful with how we manage these dogs, especially when they're puppies. So is there anything we can do about this over or under vaccinating problem? There is. VaxiCheck has a, a product, um, BioGal has a product called VaxiCheck. And uh, this product is a blood test that only requires a few drops of blood, and it will check our antibody levels for our three core viruses, for a parvovirus, a stempovirus, and adenovirus. What does it mean to check these antibodies? It means that if we see that the levels of antibodies are high enough, we don't need to currently be vaccinated the dog. If the levels are low, or if there are no antibodies, then we do need to currently be vaccinated this dog. But how can we make this check part of our routine? So most veterinarians will recommend a yearly checkup, especially with senior dogs, they'll also recommend a yearly general blood test. So instead of automatically vaccinating our dogs, we can make it part of our yearly checkup to check if this dog currently needs to be revaccinated or not. If the dog needs to be revaccinated, great, we know that we need to better protect him and, and do a booster shot. If the dog does not need to be revaccinated, then we don't need to vaccinate and we can wait a year and recheck on our next yearly checkup. Thank you very much for your time. It's been a pleasure and I will meet you for our next webinar. Have a great day.